Good evening, everyone. Hello, and um, my sincere welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for the annual meeting of the Home Construction Regulatory Authority. And you will hear me be saying HCRA for short quite a lot. I'm Marg Rappolt, and I have the great pleasure of being chair of the Board of Directors. On behalf of the board and the HCR, HCRA staff, Wendy and her team, I want to welcome you to our annual meeting. Both those of you who are here in person, thank you very much for the effort of getting here through Ontario and Toronto traffic. And uh, thank you to everyone online uh, for making the commitment to join us uh, this afternoon. This is a first for us. Previously, we've only held our annual meeting virtually, and we're thrilled to be here in person together. We understand that not everyone can be here with us, um, so it's always important to have an online presence. That will be the future way of business for all of us. I'd like to begin our meeting by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Petun First Nations. Welcome, everyone the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit. Because uh, we are also presenting virtually, I want to extend my acknowledgement across the province, recognizing the indigenous peoples of the lands that we are on today. Together, let us take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands we each call home. We thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. The HCRA is committed to meaningful engagement with all of our stakeholders, all of you here today and beyond. This, of course, includes home builders and vendors, and I've introduced myself to several in the room this evening, the licensees whose standards and professionalism we regulate and enforce. And it also includes, of course, new home purchasers and other consumers whose protection is our core mandate. We continue to build strong relations with other partners, our real estate professionals, building officials across the province, home inspectors, government and other stakeholders in Ontario's robust home building sector. Today's annual meeting is a great opportunity for the HCRA to, to provide all of you an update. Following the formal portion of our meeting, we will move into a live question and answer period and we'll provide some more information on that after the formal portion of our meeting concludes. Many of you already know at least a fair bit about the HCRA, but let me give you a quick summary of our role. In brief, we're responsible for regulating and licensing the people and companies who build and sell new homes in, a, in the province. The HCRA is a not-for-profit corporation that is designated by the provincial government to administer and enforce the New Home Construction Licensing Act of 2017 and all of its associate leg regulations. We operate independently of government and industry and we are committed to regulatory excellence. The Ministry of Public, Business, Public and Business Service Delivery retains responsibility for our legislation and oversight of the HCRA. The HCRA ensures consistency across the sector, deterring unethical and illegal builders and ensuring a fair marketplace. In addition to licensing, the HCRA provides educational information for consumers on their home buying journey. It's a critical role that we play. We also host the Builder Directory, which provides background information about each of Ontario's more than 6,500 licensed builders and vendors. So that's a bit of background about us. Now let me officially call this meeting to order as we go through our formal agenda. I mentioned that this is our first in-person annual meeting. It is also a first for me personally as chair, a position I assumed last September, last year at this time. Um, I want to take a moment to sincerely thank my predecessor, Virginia West, for her leadership as chair and helping to successfully launch the organization Virginia remains on the board as past chair and we're delighted with that and she continues to provide valued advice and guidance as do all the board members. Virginia happens to be out of the province right now unavoidably um, so she's not able to join us 
this evening, um, but she expresses her very best wishes to everyone. Um, let me introduce all of our board members to you. There we are. First of all, of Maharaj, our members of our corporation, of course, are sitting directly in front of me. And uh, Av, of course, is here. Av is the vice chair of the board and has worked uh, in great partnership with me over this last while. And he is chair of our finance, audit, and risk committee. Next, I'll introduce Salvatore Sam Biasucci. And uh, Sam is a brand new elected um, member of our board of directors, and we welcome him very much. His home base is Sault Ste. Marie, uh, with offices in other places in the province as well. Rinku Deswal is with us this evening, and uh, you will see Rinku here. Rinku is a litigator with um, almost 20 years' experience uh, in a range of corporate and other areas. Um, Rinku has a commitment out of province uh, this evening um, at her alma mater where she is professing. She's uh, teaching this evening, so we're very appreciative. Uh, Rinku has joined us online and she is part of our meeting this evening. Hugh Heron is an elected member and uh, has been with the HCRA since its very inception as startup on our journey and we welcome him. Uh, Mary Cardis Burton chairs our Governance, People and Culture Committee and is with us this evening. David Stimak is uh, a licensee who is from London, Ontario and a, uh, and a ministerial appointment to our nine member board. Virginia West, who I've mentioned, uh, past chair, and Terence Young. Thank you very much, Terence, for joining us. Terence is an experienced consumer advocate and also a ministerial appointee to our board. On behalf of the board, I would also like to extend my thanks to Eric Donauden, who served on the board of directors from March 21 to March 23, and Eric stepped down from the board at that time due to his very heavy competing commitments in his own community and beyond. James Ryu is with us in the room. James is HCRA's general counsel, and he will act as secretary for this meeting. Proper notice of the meeting has been given, and a quorum of members is present. It's my pleasure to call this annual meeting of members to order. This meeting is open to the public, and we welcome everyone who has joined us in person and online. I want to express deep appreciation to other members of the board, the HCRA staff, and the many stakeholders who, who support this vital organization. And that includes, of course, our government colleagues, Minister Khalid Rashid and the Ministry of Public and Business Service Delivery, who is our host ministry. Our first item of business is the approval of the agenda for this meeting and approval of the minutes from last year's annual meeting. The agenda and the minutes were distributed to members with the notice of meeting. May I have a motion to approve the agenda and minutes? I see um, and I thank Av Maharaj and David Stimak for moving and seconding the motion. All members please vote by the show of hands. I declare the motion carried, thank you. It's now my great pleasure to introduce a special guest on video, and we all understand our virtual world these days. The Honorable Khalid Rashid is Ontario's Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery, which is, of course, our host ministry. Minister Rashid is the very first to hold this title, and he was appointed to the newly named ministry shortly after last year's provincial election. In that election, Minister Rashid was re-elected as the MPP for Mississauga East Cooksville, where he's been an MPP since 2018. In his first term, he served as Deputy Government Whip and then was assigned to the brand new role of Associate Minister of Digital Government in the Ministry of Finance. And in June, he took on his new current portfolio of Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. And we are so very uh, delighted to welcome him on video. And all going well, our colleague teams will technically have set this up. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Regrettably, I'm unable to attend in person, but I'm delighted to bring greetings on behalf of the Ministry of Public and Business Service Delivery. First off, to Wendy Morris, CEO 
I applaud your steadfast guidance and expertise. To Marg Rapold, Chair of your Board of Directors, thank you for your leadership and dedication. And last but not least, to the ACRA's board members and staff, thank you for all your tireless work for the people of our great province. As one of our government's key partners, your work ensures Ontarians are protected when buying and residing in their newly built homes. It is your organization that helps us in holding licensed builders to professional standards and protecting the public interest. This is crucial to enhancing consumer confidence in the home building industry in Ontario. As a relatively new administrative authority, the ACRA has accomplished a lot in almost two and a half years, and you should be very proud of your work this past year. Your collective efforts to protect the public interest by upholding a fair, safe, and informed marketplace has contributed to building a strong foundation for Ontario's home building industry. As you know, our government continues to make legislative enhancements to tackle unethical behavior by builders and vendors, ones that would strengthen your organization's enforcement powers. In addition to our Housing Supply Action Plan, we recently sought input through Ontario's regulatory registry exploring potential new consumer protections, including a cooling off period for buyers of new freehold homes, a requirement that buyers of all new homes receive legal advice on their agreements of purchase and sale, and safeguards for home buyers against price escalation following the signing of agreements through setting criteria to what constitutes a conscionable increase. We are currently assessing feedback from the public and industry stakeholders to determine next steps and will keep you informed of any initiatives that may impact your organization. By enhancing the ACRA with more tools to hold new home builders and vendors to account, our government is keeping consumers better protected. And as our government continues to explore ways to tackle our province's housing supply crisis and build at least 1.5 million homes, your organization will continue to play a critical role in enforcing requirements for builders and vendors of new homes. Ontarians expect and deserve to know their home is well built and safe so they can focus on what matters to them most, whether that is work, play, or spending their valuable times with their loved ones. Together, I know we can continue to build a bright and prosperous future for our great province and for all the people who call it home. There are great things on the horizon for Ontario's housing sector, and I'm grateful to have the ACRA alongside me on this journey. It has been a pleasure addressing you this evening. As you undertake some very important work, my ministry and I wish you very much success in your endeavors. Thank you, and I wish you all a productive and engaging meeting. Wonderful. We thank Minister Rashid uh, for these kind, generous, and encouraging words to our organization. The next uh, item on the agenda is the Chair's report, which I'm happy to provide. As I've said, I've had the great pleasure of being with this organization on the board since its earliest days in startup mode, and I've also had the pleasure of serving as Vice Chair. This has given me a front row seat to help guide the evolution of the organization from its inception 
through all the planning and preparation, and it seems like a very long time ago, but it really isn't that long ago. Uh, and all of that mostly happened, I would say, during the pandemic, through to the formal launch of the organization, a very important milestone in February of 2021, and now uh, overseeing a um, fully supported and operational organization more than two years out. It's been uh, what I would say is an appropriately demanding role and ultimately very, very fulfilling. This past year in particular was transformative for the HCRA. The organization moved from startup mode to becoming an established overseer of Ontario's new home construction sector. The HCRA is financially stable and prudent in our spending while ensuring that there are sufficient resources to meet our mandate. When we launched, we established two broad goals. First, um, we committed to being a trusted resource for consumers. That is the core of our mandate. Our aim is to give them confidence and protection as they buy a new home, which for most is a major transaction and a life-changing decision. Secondly, we strive and we still strive to be a respected regulator among licensees. We're responsible for enforcing very high standards of professional conduct for builders and vendors. And in doing so, we ensure a level playing field throughout the new home building marketplace. We're achieving this objective as we continue to define and refine conduct requirements. And we strive to be responsive to both consumer and business needs. We also provide useful education on home buying process and give consumers and the public a channel to address concerns they may have with the conduct of licensed builders and vendors. And I would say consumer education research um, continues to be a top priority and we look, we look forward to more progress on that over the course of this year. We are always looking for ways to be an efficient and a modern regulator. Improving the online experience that we're all a part of these days is very important. A notable accomplishment this year has been enhancing our online presence in a range of ways to make the experience for both consumers and licensees easier and more accessible. It's an ongoing journey, lots of work to do. We can point to success here as well through our website and changes to the builder directory to add more and clearer information and further enhancements to both the website and the directory are in the pipeline. Getting to this point has necessitated some clear action, some difficult decisions. For the first time, HCRA suspended and even revoked licenses. These are serious steps, deliberative steps, but they send a clear message that failure to meet the HCRA's, HCRA's expectations can't be tolerated. New home buyers must be protected while builders and vendors must be assured of professional conduct. I must emphasize that we know the vast majority of the 6,500 plus licensees in the province adhere to these standards willingly. They meet the HCRA's expectations. It's the few so-called bad apples whose conduct we must address, and we're doing so. This includes unlicensed builders and vendors. Illegal building robs consumers and their rights and creates an uneven playing field for licensed builders who do follow the rules. As we increase our enforcement efforts, illegal builders will have to stop building or become legitimate qualified licensees. Especially with housing being such a hot topic, we heard so from Minister Rashid, promoting the growth of the regulated licensed home building industry contributes to strengthening Ontario's economy and our housing inventory. That growth also demands higher levels of oversight, and to that end, the HCRA continues to ensure that builders and vendors, whether they're joining the sector with a new license or renewing an existing license, they always maintain high levels of professionalism and competency. Um, as the industry continues to grow, the HCRA will be vigilant in assessing licensing qualifications and thorough in following up on complaints to maintain this high level of professionalism and get the few bad actors out of the market. I would say we're very proud of our code of, code of ethics that came into effect in 2021, uh, and I think it's a, it's a very important guide for our licensees and in building industry.
On behalf of the HCRA Board, I want to thank our CEO and Registrar, Wendy Moore, to my left, who, along with the entire senior leadership team, has very admirably steered the HCRA to its current steady state. Again, I have to emphasize, um, we are a new administrative authority. We have not been along, uh, around that long, and uh, I think the progress made toward our end state is very notable. Plenty of work is still to be done, of course, and we're committed to continuous improvement. As board chair, I'm pleased to report success on many fronts and that the HCA, HCRA is well positioned to continue to provide excellent oversight of an ethical and thriving new home construction sector. Thank you for helping us get here, and we look forward to working with you and for you in the years ahead. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Wendy Moore, the HCRA's CEO and Registrar. Wendy has over 20 years of experience in the licensing and regulation of professionals, legislative and policy development, construction, housing, and consumer protection. We're delighted that she continues to lead our organization, and it's my pleasure to introduce her for her report. Thank you, Mark, and uh, hello, everyone. It's definitely been an interesting and challenging couple of years, and I'm really pleased to report on good progress and success on multiple fronts in 22-23 uh, this evening. As Mark said, we saw um, many real firsts during this period, significant milestones for the HCRA, and I'd like to share a few of those milestones and other accomplishments now. Uh, in 22-23, the HCRA processed more than 6,700 license applications and renewals. As the HCRA and the sector that we oversee continues to evolve, our regulatory uh, environment is also changing. And uh, one of our key milestones during the past year uh, was adding administrative penalties, which are financial penalties uh, similar to fines. Um, added those to the HCRA's um, enforcement toolkit. Uh, the new regulation enables the HCRA to consider whether a licensee benefited financially from breaking the rules. Um, and if we include, conclude that this has happened, we can impose a fine for the violation itself. And uh, we can also, depending on the circumstances, um, we can levy additional penalties. Uh, they may be imposed and collected as funds for adversely impacted consumers. The first application of this tool came after an HCRA investigation into consumer complaints about cancelled contracts and unreturned deposits. And that resulted in the builder paying nearly $2.6 million in penalties, uh, which was paid out to 141 affected purchasers. And uh, speaking of our enforcement toolkit generally, we definitely used it this past year. As Marg mentioned in her, her report, uh, most licensees really do a good job of meeting uh, professional standards. But those of, uh, who don't must be held accountable and we're not shying away from taking action when necessary. Over the past year, this included laying charges for building or selling without being licensed and failing to enroll new homes in the warranty program, suspending a license and freezing assets while the HCRA investigated alleged misconduct, revoking licenses, which is the first time we've ever done that. Uh, and obviously this is the most severe uh, measure we can implement, prohibiting a builder from working in Ontario. And we don't take that lightly. However, licensees must understand that there can be serious consequences for breaching the law. And we don't relish taking those steps, but everyone must understand that we will uh, prosecute those who contravene provincial laws, regulations, and our code of ethics. Again, the vast majority of our licensees do act professionally and provide good customer service but we do recognize that sometimes things go wrong. Uh, the actions we took this last year against licensees stemmed from complaints that were made to the HCRA and be, made them uh, us aware of those infractions. So the complaints process is really an uh, important uh, piece of all of this. 
We continue to take all such reports very seriously. Uh, we received many complaints, more than 800 last year, and some definitely don't fall under our jurisdiction, and we direct those complaints to the appropriate channels. <clears throat> The HCRA's complaint system um, operates on two fundamental principles, giving consumers a clear uh, path to voice their concerns and ensuring fair adjudication of the matter for all parties involved. The HCR is committed to responding to every complaint we receive with the most serious matters given the highest priority. Every complaint is assessed to determine the appropriate response. Complaints are addressed based on the seriousness and potential harm to the public. But of course, each situation is different and must be thoroughly evaluated on the facts and the merits. We're dedicating the necessary resources to the complaints process, providing an impartial review of matters from the perspectives of both consumers and builders being fair to all sides. And I think it's important for everybody to understand that. When we do receive complaints, we get all of the information from both the complainant themselves and the builder. But one of the ways we try to avoid those complaints to begin with uh, is to make sure licensees understand our expectations. And in that regard, we've issued a number of advisories clarifying key points. Our advisories last year included uh, advisory number 10, we reminded licensees and applicants that, that they're obliged to provide the HCRA with the information it requests in a timely manner. Advisory 11, this was a key one, drew attention to rules around price escalations and contract terminations. That's another issue that's been in the news uh, lately, you've probably all seen it, and we wanted to make sure that licensees understand that they must abide by agreements of purchase and sale in a way that is both legal and which conforms to the principles set out in the Code of Ethics. Advisory 12 reminded licensees of their legal and ethical obligations, including never using intimidation or coercion or applying undue pressure to any person and never pressuring a person to withdraw or not to submit a complaint or concern to the HCR related to uh, a licensee's conduct. And all of these advisories were developed as a result of trends that we were seeing or uh, complaints that we were getting um, through the complaints process. And after we learned how to deal with those, what these issues were, immediately we developed these advisories so that licensees can really clearly understand uh, what our expectations are rather than inadvertently getting into trouble because they did not understand what our expectations were. So we do want to be fair in that regard. And uh, we have three new uh, advisories under development right now and that, that are coming out soon, including one on the consequences of licensees working with unlicensed builders or vendors, uh, one on the HCRA's expectations of licensees involved in delayed closings, and another on our licensees' obligations to provide the HCRA with notice of a material change to their license. And on that last one, uh, what does that mean, a material change? It sounds like paperwork, right? And it is paperwork, but it's important paperwork. And um, a material change, for example, could be a licensee letting us know when one of their key personnel has changed or left the company. Perhaps that key personnel had, was holding the competency of the company. I mean, imagine for a minute that you're a homeowner and you have a builder uh, building your home and the key person that held the building code competency, for example, leaves the firm. You would want to know that and you would want to know that construction wasn't going to continue until we made sure that the company was actually competent because competencies are from people. I mean, companies aren't competent. People in the companies are competent. Um, so that's an example of something where we would want to know. Uh, and the good news is that most of the builders would have no problem filling that gap. You know, they have redundancies. They have plenty of people that are competent. But for those of that don't, uh, we definitely want to have eyes on that and make sure that they fill that gap in the consumer interest. 
So these are a few examples of uh, how important our advisories are. And um, I just wanted to mention also that we do consult when we develop these advisories. And we have a fantastic consumer advisory council and an industry advisory council that we talk to all the time. Um, and they really help us make sure that our advisees are clear that, and that they're on point. So I want to thank them for their input over the past year as well. Now, sl next slide. Uh, communication, as you can see, is a key focus for the HCRA. And uh, the advisories are directed to our licensees, but we also took steps to provide useful information to consumers and the broader public. Uh, we're really proud of our new blog, The Home Front. You can find that on our website. Topics last year included the Ontario Builder Directory, step one in choosing a new home builder, and license to build new homes. Without one, it's illegal in Ontario. Another one was builders must honor their contracts and buyers should never be bullied. So we encourage everyone to read the Homefront blog, which we'll continue to base on topics we know are of interest to consumers. And if any of you have any ideas of things that you'd like to see in that blog, please feel free to reach out to us. So those are just a few highlights from 22-23. Uh, I encourage everyone to read our annual report, from, which provides more detail on these initiatives and our ongoing efforts to engage with our stakeholders at all levels, to ensure that they're aware of the HCRA's work and to build long-term productive relationships. Ontario's new home building sector continues to grow. We're proud of the solid and productive relationships we're fostering with consumers, builders and vendors, other home building stakeholders and government. The HCRA will continue to strive to ensure that it remains well regulated, professional and ethical. Uh, I also want to thank the board at this time for your excellent guidance and to my amazing staff for their diligence and creative approach to our work protecting consumers. Thank you all, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have during the question and answer session. Thank you, Wendy, for your report today and your leadership. The next item on our annual meeting agenda is our financial report. We have completed our financial year ending March 31, 2023. Members received the financial statements and the auditor's report thereon and the agenda material for the meeting. I'll call on Av Maharaj, chair of our Finance Audit and Risk Committee, who will provide our financial highlights. Thanks, Av. Thanks, Mark. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. I'm pleased to report on the financial statements for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2023. This is the second full year of operation for the HCRA that began operations February 1st, 2021. The HCRA continues to manage its resources in a fiscally prudent manner to ensure that it meets its obligations to government, the public, and list all other stakeholders. The operating revenues for the fiscal year were derived primar primarily from funding for new licensing and renewal fees and the per unit oversight fee. Together, these uh, fees accounted for almost 93% of the total revenue of HCRA, which was $16.77 million. The HCRA has a number of agreements with Tarion Warranty Corporation associated with the initial startup phase of HCRA after the split uh, from Tarion. Those made up approximately $373,000. Expenses increased over the previous year to $11.29 million, primarily due to increased staffing costs as the HCRA continues to recruit to full staffing levels required to operate. The excess of revenue over expenses is $5.49 million, driven by higher revenues than forecasted for the fiscal and prudent management of expenses by HCRA. As a very new not-for-profit regulator, the HCRA is also looking to build up an operating reserve. 
KPMG, which are the auditors for the HCRA, have confirmed the financial statements that, and they present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the HCRA and the results of the HCR operations and cash flows for the year ending March 31st, 2023. Thank you, Al. <clears throat> Members, is there any discussion of the financial or the auditor's report thereon? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the resolution to reappoint the firm of KPMG LLP as auditor of the HCRA until the close of the next annual meeting of members. I want to thank Hugh Heron and Mary Cardis Burton for moving and seconding the motion. All members, please vote by a show of hands. Thank you. I declare the motion carried. The annual report, which includes the financial statements, is posted on our website, um, along with many other documents. I think it's um, quite an accessible website, in my opinion. Um, and uh, you will find our annual report, our business plan, our strategic plan, and uh, more guiding documents at your leisure. Um, we're pleased to be able to share this snapshot, and it's truly been a productive year for the HCRA. The next item of business is the election of directors. And as I have a conflict of interest, I'm now turning the chair over again to Av Maharaj, Vice Chair, to conduct the election. Thanks, Mark. Clearly, I'm getting my steps in. Um, so with that, the HRA has six elected directors and three appointed by the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Each elected director serves a three-year term on a staggered schedule, so the members elect two directors each year. The resolution before the members today is to elect Sam Biasucci and Marg Rippold to serve a three-year term as director of the corporation. May I have a motion to approve the resolution? I want to thank Dave Stimek and Terence Young for moving and seconding the motion. All members, please vote by a show of hands. I declare the motion carried. Thank you. I return the chair to Mark. Having concluded the business on the agenda for today's meeting, I declare the annual meeting to be adjourned. We'll now move on to the public questions and answers. And to moderate this segment, let me introduce Tess Lynn. Uh, Tess is the HCRA's Director of Communications and Stakeholder Relations. Thank you very much, Tess, and we look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. And uh, we're going to open it up to uh, discussion now. And as we head into our question period, for which we've allotted 30 minutes, I'm just going to go over um, some instructions. So because we are a hybrid meeting today, um, we, are, we will be able to take questions both from the audience today and also online. So we'll just alternate. And so um, in terms of um, folks who want to ask questions here, we do have a microphone set up. Um, and uh, we'll just ask you to line up there. For folks who are joining us online, um, we'll just ask you to insert any questions that you may have using the question button. If you click on there, you'll be able to submit a question. And a member of my team will be able to facilitate that to myself. And I'll read out the question uh, to everybody here. Um, and so we'll, go, we'll try and get to as many questions as we can. And um, if we're not able to get to your question, it is our commitment to uh, get to everybody's answer offline. And so we will email you uh, directly. And if you have any technical issues, we have a team here that is able to help you. And if you want to just email help at livecast.ca for any uh, technical assistance. And so whether you're asking your questions live here or online, just a few points I want to go over. And just a reminder, uh, this is not the appropriate forum to ask individual cases. Please keep your questions to a general nature, as we will not be able to comment or provide on updates or, or, or ongoing uh, cases. 
So to keep the segment moving, uh, please only ask one question at a time without follow-ups. You can always line up again for your question. Um, and again, I'd like to keep, remind you to keep your questions brief um, to respect anybody that is waiting in the queue. And again, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So thank you in advance for your cooperation. So I'm gonna open it to the floor now, but I do see we do have some, some questions online. So I'm gonna kick it off with some of the questions I've, I've seen floating through. And so the first question is, 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 is uh, coming from a member online and their question is, what is the purpose of the Ontario Build Directory? How often is it updated? And where does the information coming from? So thank you for the question. And uh, I'm gonna turn this one over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Tess. Uh, very good question. The purpose of the Ontario Builder Directory, of course, is to educate and inform consumers so that they have the information that they need when they are selecting their builder. Uh, there is information there from a variety of sources. I mean, mostly it is from the 8CRA's database itself. We also have information on that, on the directory um, from Tarion regarding warranty claims. And there's a lot of information on there about decisions that we make at the 8CRA. So if we have made a decision as a result of a complaint to place a condition on a license, even to suspend or revoke, you'd be able to go onto the uh, builder directory and see that information there. There's also a lot of information on the history of the builder. So you can see you know, how um, busy a builder is, how many um, homes that they've enrolled, how many uh, possessions that they have. And uh, there have been quite a lot of changes to that, uh, the builder directory in, in the past year, including adding new information about uh, contract terminations, in fact. Um, we are constantly looking to improve the usefulness of the directory. Um, in fact, just I think about two weeks ago, we changed the directory so that now when you go on, you know a lot of how a lot of builders, they have different licenses for different projects. You can actually go on and see very clearly related companies. So at a glance, you can see the history of the full company, not just the specific, specific license for this, the specific project. And oh, there was uh, part of that question was also how often is it updated? Um, most of our information is updated sort of instantly, like within a day. Um, some, uh, there is some warranty data that is updated quarterly. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, why don't we go to the audience? So um, if you want to approach the microphone and maybe just say your name and, and we'll go ahead with your question. Thank you. Hi, my name is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Gail Dudek. And my question is, what, have, what has the HCRA done to make the HCRA addendum more accessible for home buyers and harder for builders to manipulate to cancel projects? As an example, builders using the vague hard services not completed excuse to cancel new home buyer contracts and resell the same houses at higher prices, say two weeks later. Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for coming, Gail. I appreciate your question. Um, yeah, I under and I understand where that question is coming from. There is definitely some uh, language in the uh, addenda um, that we are interested in reviewing. Of course, it is uh, it's something that we've uh, discussed with the ministry, who really has um, the. Uh, the addenda is in regulation, not the addenda itself, but the reference to the, the version of the addenda is in regulation. So it does um, require cabinet approval to change. Um, however, they are definitely interested in looking at it. If you look at uh, the ministry's recent consultation around price escalations and uh, contracts, um, you can see that there is interest in looking at that addenda. So I'm sure we will be engaging them uh, in the future on that topic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Wendy. We'll go to another question that we have online. So the question is, some consumers have said that when a builder changes its name and gets a new license number, that their previous record is no longer attached to their builder record. How is this good for consumers? That's, that's a fantastic question because um, 
there's, I think there's a real misunderstanding about that. In fact, even though, yes, a builder can uh, and does all the time um, set up new licenses for, for projects, um, the history of the principals, directors, or officers, or really any interested party in that company, really travels with them. So we look at that when we are issuing a new license. Um, there's a piece in the regulation that um, says that the registrar must be satisfied that those principals, directors, or officers have the financial competencies, competencies and that they will act um, with integrity and honesty according to the law. So it's not a matter of just opening up a, a new company and that your history will not travel with you. That, that is incorrect. But definitely something that I think a lot of people um, don't understand. So thanks for clarifying. Thank you, Wendy. And now we'll go to the next person in line. If you could just state your name and we'll go from your, we'll take your question from there. Thank you. Sure. My name is Nina Deeb. I'm a real estate broker. I've been a realtor uh, for since 1996, full-time realtor. My question is on from your uh, annual report on page 13. Uh, administrative penalty framework. New regulations on April 14th. Uh, there's new regulations prescribing that the HCRA may use the funds it collects from administrative monetary penalties and discipline committee fines. To uh, this funds that it collects can be used to support the HCRA operations and to provide payments to people adversely impacted by contraventions. The end is, uh, I'm, maybe it was thought of after, I'm not sure. Uh, the question I have for this, for this private, not-for-profit corporation, you're a non-government organization. Um, I take issue with a private corporation such as yourselves, which has grown from zero dollars to, I think it was $13 million within a couple bats of an eye. So I take issue with a corporation such as yourselves, A, not paying taxes to uh, support our province and our country. You don't pay taxes. That's the first problem I have with you. The second problem I have is a private corporation charging fines to support its we don't even know what your staff makes. Um, you can, you are motivated by charging fines to support your own uh, private corporation. This is perverse. The taxpayers of Ontario are not interested in subsidizing your private corporation. You should be paying taxes. All delegated authorities should be paying taxes. The question I have for you is, why would the taxpayers of Ontario want to forego the taxes on these millions of dollars that you're collecting from consumers? not from builders, you're actually collecting most of this money from my clients, which are buyers. Buyers are paying these unit fees. What qualifies you as a private corporation to not pay any taxes? Uh, I would say that is a matter of public policy. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I thank you for the question and um, I think it's multifold. Um, yes, um, we as a not-for-profit corporation will be governed by the not-for-profit corporation legislation. And um, I'm, I'm understanding that your expression of concern regarding taxes is something um, you are concerned about regarding all of the administrative authorities in the government. So I appreciate hearing that. And that is a matter of government public policy. Um, I want to also, though, acknowledge um, uh, your discussion of our new authority of administrative monetary penalties. And it is a new tool. Um, and I would say it's one that requires uh, deliberate and careful application. Our registrar um, follows a policy as to how it is applied. And because it's so recent, it has been used extraordinarily rarely, um, but the purpose is to remedy further harm, experience financial harm, hardship from the aggrieved homeowner. So that's what I can say for now. It is a new power given by the provincial government to us, um, and we will, we will continue to exercise and administer it carefully. Thank you, Mark, and thank, thank you, you, Wendy. We'll go 
on to our next question, and the question is, why are some HCRA cases referred to the LAT uh, and not to your internal discipline and appeals committee? And why have you not referred more cases to this committee? So maybe, uh, Wendy, you want to comment on this one? Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, first of all, uh, yes, uh, we do not actually refer cases to LAT. That's the Licensing Appeal Tribunal. Uh, we make decisions, some of the decisions that I mentioned earlier in my notes, um, that can be appealed to the Licensing Appeal Tribunal. And in fact, the kind of decisions that do get appealed to the Licensing Appeal Tribunal are like suspensions, conditions on licenses, um, revocations. Those decisions, which are quite serious decisions, but you know necessary in some cases, are in fact tools that the discipline committee does not have at its disposal. So when we need to make those kind of more serious uh, determinations, we use those tools rather than referring to the discipline committee. The discipline committee um, may mandate education, uh, which I can also do directly as the registrar, either through condition or registrar's order. And the discipline committee can also levy fines, um, which, as you've heard, we can also issue uh, administrative penalties. I think the benefit to the discipline committee, which we haven't used very much because the other tools did seem more appropriate and the decisions that we've had to make so far, is that it's a very public process. So I think when we get something that we want to you to be able to see and go online and see that public process, we will definitely be referring to the discipline committee instead of making those direct decisions that uh, are, in, in many cases, appealable to the LAT. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, we'll take another question from the audience. And so if you could step up and state your name and we'll go from there. Hi, my name is Frank McGinnis. Um, I just have a question. When a builder's license expires, because I understand it only lasts for a year, um, how long does it take for the builder to get that renewed, if that's the right word? Oh, if they apply, sorry, if they apply for a renewal, you mean? No, yes. they, have a, they have an existing license. It only yes. lasts for a year. Yes. It comes up oh. at the end of the year. It's yeah. now done. When does that get renewed? Well, it's, okay. an, it's an annual renewal that the builder applies for. Right, and so he's applied, let's say the builder applies for it, how long does that process take? Uh, our service standard for that is four weeks, although I'm very pleased to say that our timing for that is much shorter than that at the moment. Right, so if it's longer than that, how would a, how would a homeowner look in a directory where it says underneath the builder's name, license under review, how long does the homeowner wait to, to see if that builder is actually legitimate? Because Oh, I see what you're saying, yes. So the the way it works is that while, if if the builder has applied for renewal of their license, while while it's under review, they are still allowed legally to build. So their, their license is actually still good at that point. For how long? Um, until it's reviewed. That, that's, so, the re that's the review point, the time I was trying to get at. How long does it take you to review that? Oh, well, right. It, our service standard is four weeks not ten months. from when they actually not 10 weeks no um, 10 months actually I think right now that is our service standard at the beginning when we were in uh, startup mode definitely we had some situations where there were hundreds of renewals that had been not renewed when we opened doors from Tarion and we definitely had a backlog so you may have it experienced longer wait times at that time we certainly that is uh, far behind us I'm very happy to say but currently you're saying it's four weeks -ish. it for a complete application I mean there are always outliers where there might be something we have to look at in more detail that takes a little bit longer or if the the applicant has not sent in the information um, at some point of course we do if if the, the license isn't complete and the renewal isn't going to complete, we will cancel the license. Okay, as a homeowner, I'm trying to understand the builder's registry, so it actually helps me. Yeah, right so now, it, if, it's it not, if it's not closed, it's still good. If it's expired but under renewal, <clears throat> it's still fine for you to. Yeah, but you just told me it takes you four weeks to 
to go through a renewal process. What I'm looking uh, up at to is four something weeks, that's yeah. 10 months old, current. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't. Maybe we should talk later. Maybe yeah, I, I can. Uh, I can definitely uh, take uh, a look at your specific situation. Obviously, I, I don't know what that is, but sure. happy to look at that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Wendy. And um, actually, we have a uh, another question come online, and 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 the question is, if a complaint is filed against a builder, and the complaint is not yet addressed by the time the builder's license expires. Will the HCRA continue its investigation should this builder reapply for a license and thereby receive a new uh, license number? And if the HCRA does not continue the investigation, what course of action does the home buyer have? So maybe I'll, re <laughs> I'll, I'll say it again. It was kind of a long question, sorry, I'm, as I'm reading it live, um, if you just bear with me. Um, so if a, cl a complaint is filed against a builder and that complaint is not addressed by the time that the builder's license ex is expired. Um, so the first part of the question seems to be, can this builder with a complaint then go ahead and obtain a renewal? If, it's, if, they're, still, if they're under, if yes. there's a, still a complaint? Yes. Um, I mean, typically we do try to separate the renewal process from the complaint process. It really kind of depends on the complaint itself because, of course, until we've come to a conclusion about the complaint, there's no, it hasn't been um, justified necessarily. So you wouldn't want to stop a builder from building when you haven't made a decision about their license yet. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think we can go to uh, another question from the audience. If you want to just uh, sure. go Good ahead. Evening. My name is Kathy. Um, in 2022, HCRA hired a firm to conduct a survey related to the Ontario Builder Directory. Have the results of the survey been published to date? And if I may make a humble suggestion, you guys need a search uh, function on your website. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And yes, I agree with you about the website search function. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the work that we're doing right now, absolutely. Um, so we have received, yes, we, it, was, it was a great consultation. We got lots of information out of that and we have started to implement some of that. Uh, really the, the biggest thing that we got, I think, out of the consultation is that there is still some confusion about some terminology and definitions that we're using. So that's really our number one priority is to um, improve those definitions and terminology. The other one was the confusion around the related companies, which we have already taken action on, so. Question. Um, this question um, is, how are you dealing with builders who have reopened signed contracts to demand more money from purchasers? Why is this allowed? Um, it, yeah, usually it isn't allowed. I mean, there might be um, clauses in contracts that um, do allow it, so you do have to look at them on uh, a case-by-case -case basis, although I've, I think it's always been our mantra that even if something's legal doesn't mean it's ethical, and you could still run into trouble with the HCRA for breach of the Code of Ethics, even if something is legal. We really do expect uh, builders to treat uh, customers with fairness and respect. Um, so yeah, we look, at, we look at them when we get those complaints. Thankfully, we, we haven't had as many complaints recently, um, but we look at those complaints and there can, there've been a, a kind of a wide variety of responses to that. Everything from warning letters, really depending on what, what the, the breach might have been, all the way up to revocation of licenses that you've seen and administrative penalties. It's a serious issue, that's why we issued the advisory, and I don't know if it's um, coincidence, but there have been a lot less cancellations and price escalations since we issued that advisory. So I think um, that people are taking that seriously. And I have to say, again, similar to what we were saying before, most builders do not um, escalate um, the prices in the way that you've seen reported in the papers and that we get complaints on. Most builders do actually just adhere to the contracts that they signed. Thank you, Wendy. 
And uh, we'll, we'll uh, go forward with a next question from um, one of the folks signing up. So if you could state your name yeah, and your hi. question. Uh, my name is Manu Slifo. Uh, my question is, I am totally understand that the core is to protect the consumer. But I am here, I'm asking if the HCR are having any steps to enroll a new licensee to be a part of the market or to give any kind of support? And do you have any statistic that how, how much from the six, uh, 67, 500 uh, you ha uh, builder you have it? How much they are involved in the market? Okay, so a couple questions there, and thank you for those questions. Um, yeah, we really actually welcome new builders to the market and are doing our best to t support those new builders. We've just recently re uh, um, redone our process for um, the equivalency process. So um, builders who have had experience in the market, some of one of the seven core competencies, We've made that clear for builders now to know whether or not they can apply for equivalency rather than take the courses. Um, one of the uh, new initiatives that we have moving, moving forward that I think will benefit both existing builders as well as new builders is we're just starting to launch a new research and education program. And um, the reason for that is it's a proactive move to support the industry to be as best they can, they can be. We'll be looking at um, a wide variety of research and education, but including, you know, technical um, research. Best practices on building code, which, as you know, changes frequently. The technology in the industry is um, changing frequently. So I think those resources, when they get up and running, are definitely going to be a move to help new builders enter the market. And we welcome new builders. We even welcome, <laughs> Marg mentioned, our tackling illegal building. And part of that is not simply saying illegal builders must never build again. We would actually like to bring, we know that illegal builders are out there and that they are going to build. We would like them to build as licensed builders competency, show their competencies, take the courses if they uh, can't show their competencies, and really come on board. So we, we welcome a wide variety of uh, new builders. And we do, we have an industry advisory council. I'm getting from your question that, um, you know, you might have some ideas about how we can support new builders more, and we definitely would welcome that input from you, either through the council or directly. You can contact us anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you for the question. Our next question again comes online, and it's, it's a question about um, maybe, Wendy, if you could speak to the size of our organization of the HCRA, and um, if, if this is sufficient enough to allow the HCRA to fulfill its large mandate, and, um, and if not, why and what is being done about this? Yeah, well, so, I mean, first uh, first couple of years, uh, we have definitely been growing as an organization. I would say that we are at a steady state now, that we um, have uh, enough resources um, for the time being to process our licenses, look at our complaints in a thorough and fair way. Um, I just mentioned launching a new research and education program. Just baby steps on that one. We're not uh, staffing up a university or anything like that. Um, and providing, you know, education to both consumers and builders. So I think we're actually in a really good place right now as far as being where we need to be in terms of our staffing and resources. And Tess, um, I'll just add to that. Um, the board is very supportive of um, the development and training and the competency of Wendy's staff. We've recognized and supported over the course of the last two to three years um, the need for flexible application and deployment and hiring. Um, we very much agree that we are about at steady state and as we move forward, we will support Wendy in finding the right balance in maintaining a lean and efficient 
and an innovative workforce, but one that applies resources to our core mandates very um, consistently. So uh, the board uh, pays attention and is very supportive of the direction that our CEO is going in. Thanks, Tess. And I know we're likely getting, getting close to our time. Yes, we are. I was just about to say, so maybe um, we'll, we'll go to one last question Thank from you. the audience and uh, go ahead. All right, so Frank McGinnis, um, when a homeowner uh, submits a complaint, how long does it take for that complaint to get responded to? Um, so we reach out to the complainant uh, within three to five days to get more information from the complainant and make sure that we have everything. Well, we might not have everything we need, but at least see, see what more we might need at that time. And it really, I can't give you a precise time frame because it really does depend on the case itself. And some matters are very complex. There are lawyers involved. Um, we might have to, in, in extreme cases, even issue search warrants to get information. All of those things do take time. And there's, you know, even without, you know, the more extreme measures, there's back and forth, obviously, to be able to get uh, the information we need to be able to make a fair and reasonable discussion. So we don't um, have specific timelines for complaints. Uh, but what we do is, we our metric is that we want to be, and you'll see this in the annual report if you look at it, we want to be closing as many complaints as we receive. So by having that metric in place, um, we know that, you know, it's not just an accumulating backlog that is never getting resolved. There is, um, you know, expectation that the complaints are moving through the process and getting resolved. Okay. You're going to be around later? I will. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Wendy. And um, we just have time for one final question. And uh, this one is actually um, about uh, the board. And so uh, maybe, Mar, you, you can comment on um, consumer advocate representation um, with the board. Thanks, Tess. And um, thank you um, to the person asking the question. Um, I, I would say we're, um, we're proud of our collaborative and our culture at our board, and um, we very much embrace the embrace the vision and mission of the organization, which is putting the consumer first. That we are in the business of protecting consumers um, through supporting good builders, and we have declared that in a range of ways in our strategic plan and so on. So, um, when we have the opportunity to um, bring new candidates and foster our candidates on the board, we pay attention to consumer orientation. So um, I would say all of our licensees, our three licensees on the board would say, and I wouldn't disagree, they are some of the best consumer home builder advocates we have going. And um, as we as noted, uh, we've just uh, brought on Sam Biasucci, a newest board member who shares the commitment of other builders on our board to the core mandate. You, they, we must embrace the mandate of the organization to be a high functioning board. Now, in addition, um, we've got a, a, a bunch of competency criteria that we follow as, uh, as in terms of our board appointees and their cross section of uh, financial management, um, governance, understanding regulations, Obviously, we've got lawyers, but we have a couple people whose expertise is particularly in consumer awareness, and I'm very pleased to note Terence Young, um, who is uh, with us, of course, and he is a board member who has uh, very dedicated experience in consumer advocacy, has sponsored very important consumer legislation through a legislative process, so um, we always welcome his input, and similarly, um, our uh, one of our legal counsel on the board is a litigator, Rinku, who's with us from New Brunswick tonight. And she litigates and brings her experience representing aggrieved home builders to our board very willingly. So we feel very well served. 
Thank you so much, Mark. And with that, my colleagues have flagged to me. Uh, we are out of time in terms of the Q&A portion. So I want to thank everybody for your participation. And I just want to note that if we're unable to get to your question, again, we will follow up with you directly via email. And um, if you want to discuss uh, uh, anything additional, we do have our email that's up there. I'll read it out loud anyways. That's annualmeeting at htraontario.ca. And uh, we, we, we can go further from there. So again, thank you for joining us today. And um, I haven't forgotten, I'm just noting to everybody who's attended in, in, in uh, our session live today, parking. Uh, there's going to be a QR code right outside. So we want to make sure you scan it and, and you'll be able to uh, leave the facility. Thank you again and have a great evening, everyone. Till I